In all four Gospels, they record that during his trial and his passion, everybody deserted Jesus. Yet it was the women who dared to go to the tomb first to see after the body of their leader, Jesus. Some say they wanted to anoint the body with spices, although that would have been quite a feat, since the tomb was sealed with a huge stone. More than likely, these women went to the tomb hoping against hope that this Jesus, this one who had walked on water, taught love and acceptance for everyone outside the temple, suffered little children to come unto him, healed mothers and daughters, <coughs> healed fathers and sons, healed the beloved slave of a Roman soldier, predicted that he himself would be handed over to the authorities, crucified and buried, but would, raise, but would rise again in three days. Most likely, these frightened yet brave women crept up to the tomb in the dark to see if Jesus after all of the uproar that he had caused in Jerusalem and in their lives, to see if Jesus could make good on this outrageous promise of resurrection. <clears throat> to see if this Jesus really was the risen Son of God. Now, if the stone had just been rolled away and inside they found the dead body of Jesus, the women could have Home, then sat for a while that a very gifted, very inspiring, and very good man had died. But now they would have to hide because the same authorities that had killed Jesus might now be looking for them. Or if they had gotten to the tomb and the stone was rolled away, <coughs> and there, hale and hearty, fully in the flesh, Ready to greet them, Jesus stood. Oh, how the victory celebration would have begun. You think you heard some music in here this morning. Yeah. Those women would have thrown down. We won, we won. Death did not even hurt him. Look at him. Our God is truly indestructible. All Jerusalem had seen him crucified. The sky had grown dark. The veil of the Holy of Holies was torn to pieces. But old Jerusalem, there he stands. You unbelievers are in big trouble now. As Ricky Ricardo might say, you got some explaining to do. <laughs> but all Mary Magdalene and her compadres found was an empty tomb. So frightened, they ran back. And they told Simon Peter and John, the disciple that Jesus loved, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where to find him. So they all ran back to the tomb, and John, the writer of this gospel, makes a point of saying that, as opposed to the gospel of Luke, where it says Peter reached the tomb first, I, John, the disciple that Jesus loved, the disciple who laid his head upon Jesus' breast, he makes a point of saying, I got to the tomb first. <laughs> Peter went in first, and Peter saw all of the cold case evidence. Peter saw all of the burial linens lying there, and Peter saw the cloth that had been around Jesus' head rolled up and neatly folded in a place by itself. Then John wrote, Then I went in. Saw the same thing Peter saw. But John records this. I saw and I believed. The belief of resurrection is more than the belief of resuscitation. Resuscitation means that breathing and heart beating goes on as they did before they were interrupted. But for people of faith, resurrection means something more. It means that out of the ashes of absolute, painful, horrible, slow, mind-numbing death, something new is born and emerges over which death is powerless. For people of faith, 
Resurrection means that life will never be the same because something, something has struggled with death. And it may seem that death has pinned it down and drained all of the life out of it, but a new life that we never saw coming has nevertheless emerged. If you have ever deeply loved someone, a parent, a child, a mate, a friend, and death has separated them from you, after mourning that person so deeply that you don't think you will ever recover. My father has been gone two years ago this coming Tuesday, and I feel like it was yesterday. Yet, if you are fortunate enough to still remember them with a smile, have conversations with them, and even still learn from them, you have a small insight into what people of, of faith understand when they say resurrection. Blessings to all of you who took the Holy Week journey to Little White Chapel through Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. We saw the Lord's Supper and the Passion of Christ paired up and acted out in world situations that we don't like to think about. Women and children being taken advantage of in the 21st century. Slavery in the 21st century. Continual fracking and destruction of the planet Earth. That's unpleasant stuff. That's horrible stuff. That's overwhelming stuff. And then to pair it with the crucifixion of Christ, Christ being crucified over it, it's almost more than we can stand. In the 1980s, after surviving the God is Dead movement of the 1960s, I know none of you were alive then. I'm as the oldest one here, the only one who remembers both of those. You, uh, I should say, and your parents and grandparents, we sat in churches and we heard preach from well-meaning pulpits that HIV was God's, was God's retribution against gay and other hedonistic lifestyles and that those infected with the virus deserved to die. It was God's punishment. And even though it didn't sound quite right, it didn't sound quite like love talking, we sat in silence, shocked, because the ones that we knew and loved were dying, for sure. But the decades-long response to such theology has since taken a back seat to science finding a way to make HIV a chronic condition rather than a death sentence. And psychology and sociology following suit. And oh yes, finally, grudgingly, religion. Thank you, famed evangelical minister, Dr. Tony Campolo, for at 86 allowing your wife to lead you to the tomb of your own greater awakening. God's church is beginning to find a way to begin the conversation that has resulted in more than just societal acceptance of HIV-infected people. The church is finding places of honor and leadership for people of gay, straight, bisexual, transsexual, and questioning people of goodwill to come together and stand in solidarity around God's table. When the church tried to separate itself from people of color, the same thing happened. Love said, I am not dead to these people. I live in them. When the church tried to separate itself from the leadership of women, can you imagine this church without the leadership of women? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yet it is so in some churches, and some churches that are not very far from here. The same thing happened. Love resurrected and said, those from whose very bodies every one of us sprang. These women are created to stand in equal honor around God's table. Most of them in greater honor, if you ask me. 
When the church tried to say the same thing regarding differently able people, or even left-handed people, or even barren people, saying that somehow they were not as worthy as other people, love found its voice. It took a while. But love found its voice, rose from what seemed like a tomb of silence, and said, these people are not to be placed on some altar of human sacrifice, but around God's table of blessing. Around God's table of blessing. Metaphor. What the, what the beloved disciple John saw and believed when he walked into that tomb behind Peter, might well have been this. First of all, political stealers of a body would not have paused to mutely fold and roll up a head cloth that had fallen off of a dead person who had been lying in a closed up sealed space for three days. They would have gone in there like this. We as people of faith spiritual clues. Resurrection means that it is love that rouses itself, leaves the linens of doubt, faithlessness, entitlement, and non-inclusion, and unbelief lying there on the floor, and neatly unwraps from around its head where some have chose to press a crown of thorns, neatly unwraps from around his head the linens that were meant to stop the flow of lifeblood. Love said in New York City, where hate knocked down a building, knocked down two buildings, I will build a larger tower and I'm going to put a mosque right in the center of it. Love said, I will resurrect a historic church in South Carolina built by a slaves where hate came in and tried to kill me during a Bible study. And this week, after one of the bloodiest days in Brussels' admittedly bloody history, love said, I will resurrect in the square and the train station where hate tried to blow everything up. Love said, I will have a moment of silence and then I will applaud. I will applaud for love, for love, for love, for love, for love. Easter is a celebration of a cluttered, messy, but ultimately redemptive faith. Just like this pulpit. It is cluttered but messy. There, but there are flowers that sit there at the top of it. Little children run around in the sanctuary and some people think, oh, that's cluttered and messy. But they're all your beautiful face. Faces, the faces of parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts. Our faith is cluttered and messy, but ultimately beautiful and redemptive. Are all of our questions answered? Absolutely not. But we travel on knowing and believing that love will make a way on our journey for our questions to be answered, maybe not now, maybe not tomorrow, but answered as we near the end of our journey with God. Amen? Amen. 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 John the Beloved looked through love at the arrangement of those linens in that tomb, and love didn't need to see a resurrected body. Love saw and recognized itself and believed. Love is resurrected. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. Amen. And to that, we respond with hallelujah. May the Lord bless you and keep you and prosper you for every good work, regardless of that up against which you come. May you realize that you never travel by yourself. You travel with your hand in the hand of the one who loved you since the beginning of time and is more than the world against you.